So thank you very much, and uh, it's a great pleasure to be here, and I really appreciate the um, open welcome from the patients as well as the, um, um, the, the MECFS community to um, invite uh, me over here to present and share um, our data uh, with all of you. But, um, and it was a wonderful time in the last two days. There were lots of, lots of, lots of fantastic research. Um, it's very interesting to see that uh, we have differences in opinion. The same data looks different in different labs. And um, it's also um, interesting to see that there is a merging between the labs and how they uh, think. So today I'm taking this opportunity to present our data to you as well as uh, to share that uh, the information that um, how we interpret the results and how we look into the results can give us completely different um, 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 idea about these results. So I'm going to cover a um, little bit of MECFS as well as long COVID. I'm from Germany, and I'm a group leader in Germany. So um, uh, once again, um, I'm very thankful to um, all the um, um, all the uh, MECFS. Um, charity organizations as well as um, uh, different um, um, funding agencies, which are really not big funding agencies, but they are um, very helpful um, for us in running our research. So um, I will start with a hypothesis, basically, that we heard a lot about MECFS, and everyone thinks that MECFS is not one disease, rather it's 10 different diseases. Of course, if you look into the clinical scenario of the disease, it looks like 10 disease, but I'm going a little bit away and I'm proposing that MECFS is not 10 disease, it's actually one disease. And why it's one disease and why it's um, 10 disease, I will try to explain you. So what we try to do most of the times when we are studying MECFS or we are trying to study, find a biomarker or anything, what we try to do is that we look into the blood or the serum or the plasma in the peripheral circulation. But um, Peripheral circulation is connected with tissues where we see the 10 different MECFS. Some patients have connective tissue disorders, some patients have mast cell activation, hyperactivation of platelets, microclots, and many different things. Not everyone has the same feature. It's a combination of different features in different patients. But this tells us that maybe MECFS is 10 different diseases. But if we go back to the source of the disease, I believe that these diseases start in localized tissues, like brain or brain-associated tissues, astrocytes, glial cells, or nervous system, or in the muscle cells, cardiac myocytes, more specialized tissues. And here, we can unify this hypothesis when we look into these cells. Now, we believe that the MECFS is a post-viral illness it starts as a consequence of virus infection or virus reactivation. And this we are very easily, uh, this we can learn from our experiences with long COVID. It all starts with SARS-CoV-2 infection. Here, what we see is not a consequence of virus infection reactivation directly, but it's an indirect consequence of virus reactivation. And that's why when we try to look for virus here, we don't find it. I agree with Simon that gut microbiome is very important because it's localized and you don't see the same thing in the blood. Now, it's, I, I believe that this is a site of chronic illness and this is the site of the acute illness. And if you look into the um, different symptoms or the 10 different MECFS, then we see that many of the features over here belong to the secondary chronic illness stage, which we see in the patients after a couple of months, or years of um, suffering the disease. And I believe that auto-recovery process is very difficult when they develop these symptoms. But here, which is mostly because of the virus infection, there is a possibility of auto-recovery. The body fights it out. Our own innate immune response fights it out. And these are mostly uh, the, the, the results of the uh, acute phage probably is seen in terms of the neuronal and autonomic nervous system abnormalities and immune modulations. And why I'm telling this, because I will explain you on the basis of our experiences working with long COVID patients and MECFS patients, we believe that 
this is the way how we can look into that. It's a single disease. It just pans out into different clinical conditions over a period of time. Again, I may be wrong. I'm ready to take the criticism, but this is how I look into the disease. So what I'm going to present today is a uh, study that we just recently submitted. It's a study population which compares um, random um, healthy individuals um, from general population. This is covered by a, a study called a cohort called STAP cohort, which basically takes um, in, includes the uh, people from city of Würzburg, where I live. And we have uh, a, uh, the BMBA, the German government uh, funded a consortium where we look into MECFS patients at Berlin and Munich. And we have a, a central German government uh, NAPCON consortium uh, under which we collect samples um, in covid on cohort in Würzburg area. And we have published a paper in 2022 in a um, Lancet uh, e-clinical medicine where we proposed a, um, or my colleagues proposed a um, grading system for long COVID, uh, which is exactly looks the same as we see in the new Recover paper, where we have uh, patients who got infected with SARS-CoV-2, and we collected the samples after six months of the PCR first PCR positive. All the all the patients who were repeatedly infected were uh, not included in this study, and they are not uh, the acute infected hospitalized patients. We have patients who have recovered without any major symptoms, called as a no long COVID group. We have mild long COVID group and severe long COVID group. And you can see that the population, male and female, is very much uh, uh, distributed equally, but with more number of female patients over here. And we have a large cohort of patients to come to a meaningful conclusion over here. Now, the first question that we ask is that um, we all know that herpes viruses are notorious and much discussed in MECFS field. If they are really, really um, reactivated in these patients, again, these are not acute infected patients, so the long COVID patients, these are after six to 12 months of infection. So we try to understand if there is any herpes virus signature in these patients. So um, we, again, I am a molecular biologist, infection biologist, virologist, so I try to avoid um, too much of uh, uh, omics into my experience. I do omics hardcore omics, but still, the basic knowledge comes from basic molecular science, so I try to, there is no ELISA to do this, so we developed an asset together with our colleagues from Ohio State University who are funded by NIH. Um, so we tried to develop, um, looked into IgG response against a very specific protein from the herpes virus family, and these proteins are more or less similar among all the nine herpes viruses, human herpes viruses. The aim was that these proteins are expressed very early, so you do not even need a DNA replication from the virus to get these uh, IgG response. So very leaky virus reactivation, which is actually most clinically relevant over here, are covered by this type of IgG response. The aim was to see if there is a virus reactivation during the six to 12 months after the COVID infection, then we should see an increase in the IgG response against these herpes viruses. Now what we see in MECFS patients, so it's a comparison, you can see that normally MECFS patients have um, very strong IgG response against EBV deutipase, HSV1 deutipase, as well as uh, HHV6 deutipase. Um, EBV deutipase response uh, is uh, statistically significant, not all, but still there is a trend towards more virus reactivation. But if we look into uh, the long COVID groups, we see that the HSV1 DUTPase uh, antibody response against HSV D1 DUTPase is visible in more than 50% of uh, severe long COVID patients, and there is a trend uh, of increase. Surprisingly, for EBV and HHV6 DUTPase, there is an inverse correlation say, that the more severe the patient is, the less the antibody response is. Um, um, yeah. So uh, the take home message is that there is a frequent herpes virus reactivation in MECFS and in long COVID patients, but this is not clear whether it's a contributing factor for MECFS or long COVID or not. Now, we try to understand if there is IgG response, the virus must have been reactivated. If the virus has reactivated, there is a humoral response against the viral protein, there must be viral protein. What these viral proteins are doing, so what we see here is that the viral proteins are capable of uh, causing a very specific phenotype which is called hyperpolarization of mitochondria 
or hyperfusion of mitochondria. This is not exactly that mitochondrial fragmentation. It's rather fusion of mitochondria. And we can show by molecular methods that the uh, proteins which are required for these type of activities called mitofusion 1 is upregulated in the presence of these uh, duty pages as well as the autophagy is inhibited in, uh, under these conditions. Now you don't need the protein to be expressed inside the cells because if I talk about localized virus infection or reactivation, how can this affect the total body? So we believe that if so it's known that the viral duty base proteins are secreted within exosomes and they travel throughout the body. So if we put these recombinant proteins on cells, we also see extensive viral fragment, uh, the, the mitochondrial uh, hyperfusion polarized mitochondria in cells. So the the, these, these viral proteins are capable of affecting the mitochondrial health. Now, when we are talking about virus infection or viral reactivation, which is not exactly the active or viral infection like, uh, like HSV-1, a prolonged viral infection always comes with autoimmunity. And in the field of MECFS, we know that autoimmunity is expected to play a role. Yeah, we don't know how. There are many different hypotheses. Some people or some clinicians say that G protein coupled receptors are high in these patients. So what we try to do, it's again proof of concept study. It's not a big study. We ask the question, yes, if there is any autoimmunity playing a role, can we define or divide the patients into distinct groups based on what autoantibody they are expressing? Not looking into A, B, C, D, E, rather taking a bunch by doing the experiment and telling us if there is a pattern associated with. So we looked into 120 different IgG and IgM response against autoantigens, the known autoantigens involved in different type of autoimmune disorders. And we looked into 120 different pathogen-associated autoantigens, IgG and IgM response. And we asked the data to tell us if there is any pattern associated with it. Um, unfortunately, the IgG response against all these 120 different autoantigens did not divide the patients into any groups. Of course, there is increased um, IgG against many different um, pathogens. For example, EBNA1 is very high in many patients, but they are random. There is no pattern at all. Interestingly, we found that majority of the MECFS patients have a lot of autoantibodies which overlap with uh, immune disease, autoimmune diseases like uh, lupus, multiple sclerosis. So these antibodies against double-stranded DNA, RNA, collagen-5, complement C3, and all are pretty much high in many MECFS patients. So they all have random increase in autoantibodies. Exactly, they must be doing something, but there is no pattern. We cannot tell that this autoantibody is actually causing the disease. Now, interestingly, the IgM against these autoantigens separated the entire result into three different groups, which perfectly match with severe healthy control and mild MECFS patients. And when we look into, uh, we do a PCA analysis, uh, and we look into the top 10 variables, we see that these are the major components. You can see that CRP, antibody against CRP, is very high. If you look into this, the majority of the severe MECFS patients have antibody IgM against CRP uh, very, uh, very much increased. But there's a very uh, interesting protein here is fibronectin. I'll come to it uh, uh, a little bit later. And it seems that this is the only protein, at least in our data set, which is actually decreased or depleted in severe MECFS patients. So the IgM response against fibronectin is depleted. So I just want to mention, um, we did all these experiments and um, uh, we got a tremendous help from a colleague from Stanford to analyze all this data to bring into a, uh, a form uh, where we can understand the data. Now, um, Simon presented that um, there is no um, IgG response against uh, the microbiota. There is less uh, binding of uh, these IgGs against. But it's very interesting to see that the same we saw in the, um, in the, in the serum, there is no differentiable IgG response. But when we look into IgM response, what we found is very interesting, that majority of the MECFS patients have increased IgM against a lot of environmental antigens. Yeah? 
there's no specific pattern. They fall into one group and they have um, increased IgM response against uh, dog uh, dander, endothelial cell antigen, uh, uh, diphtheria, rotavirus, and all sort of things. So it seems that the, uh, the IgM response against these uh, random infections or random antigens is being very high in these, uh, in these uh, patients. Interestingly, some of them actually correlate very nicely with disease conditions. For example, the IgM against aquaporin-4 is, uh, aquaporin-4 is the ion channel, uh, water channel protein in the uh, optic knobs, specifically uh, expressed in optic knobs. And it is known that when you have autoantibodies against aquaporin-4, then it affects the vision. And this perfectly matched with the light sensitivity with, uh, with the severe MECFS patients. Again, we, we're not doing any a big study over here. It's a proof of concept study. But it shows that individual autoantibodies might be playing towards the individual uh, clinical features of the patients. But overall, they do not define the disease as a disease. Yeah? Now, we wanted to see um, if these autoantibodies, which is circulating throughout the body, can they actually affect uh, the uh, mitochondrial health? So we isolated IgG from a large cohort of patients. So far, 30 healthy individuals and 30 CP, uh, CFS patients. And we, when we tried to put these uh, IgG into, um, into, into healthy cells in cell culture, try to see if they affect the mitochondria, an interesting feature came out that specifically in human endothelial cells, primary endothelial cells, these IgG isolated from severe MECFS patients, they cause very strong mitochondrial fragmentation, what you can see here. And this is caused by decrease in mitofusion 1 and another protein called PLD6 or mitoPLD, which basically cause the, uh, stop the uh, fusion of the protein. So it seems that the autoantibodies, which is uh, very high in MECFS patients, are capable of affecting mitochondrial health overall, and particularly in endothelial cells. Now, what we are doing in this experiment is that we are isolating IgG and throwing into the cells. So we wanted to know what exactly we are throwing onto the cell. Is it only IgG, or is it any activated immune complex proteins like C1, C3, C5, C7, or any other protein? So we did mass spec analysis, and what we saw is that there is a little bit difference in many different things, but this is not significant. What is significant is there are three very important proteins which are basically depleted within the activated immune complex of MECFS patients. So here are healthy controls and MECFS patients. And uh, these proteins are uh, transferrin, serotransferrin, alpha-2 microglobulin, and fibronectin-1 again. Now it's interesting to see that fibronectin is depleted within these immune complexes. So fibronectin is a protein which is very uh, widely or uh, frequently present in the plasma or serum. But they also participate in many different things. One of the properties of fibronectin to bind to C1 and C3 and do the uh, complement activation when there is a, a bacterial or viral infection going on in the body. Now, um, we found that uh, the fibronectin amounts are um, high in MECFS patients. Now, um, we heard during the uh, presentation that in another data set, the fibronectin is not upregulated. But we have to understand that a difference in result doesn't mean that one is wrong, one is right. I have to tell you that what we measured here is serum and what we see, the, when we measured fibronectin in serum, that actually represents so what, how do you prepare the serum. Serum is prepared after the clotting. And fibronectin is actually one of the most important factor in blood clotting. It binds to fibrin and gives the shape to the blood clot. It restricts the blood clot to go beyond its uh, limits. So what we are isolating over here is removed with the fibronectin which is going into the clot. So seeing a difference in fibronectin amount in the serum actually tells that in MECFS patients there is an alteration in clotting process also. Yeah? So we see that MECFS patients have in general in serum again have higher amount of uh, fibronectin and this can be nicely presented in a kernel density plot so you can see that MECFS patients have roughly 200 to 300 microgram per ml uh, fibronectin, whereas healthy patients have roughly around 150. Um, you can nicely uh, see that it correlates with uh, disease severity, so most severe patients have the maximum increase in uh, fibronectin amounts, whereas the mild and moderate patients don't show such a big difference. 
and it, interestingly, uh, when we looked into long COVID group, we see that um, there is a trend towards increased fibronectin amounts uh, in, the, in the serum in the long COVID group also. Now, our results are not based on high throughput experiments. We did this with ELISA, which is an extremely sensitive technique. We went ahead, we validated this with Western blotting. Now you can see here that it gives you more information than high throughput technique because it t tells you about the isoforms about the protein, what you see. So you can look here is that those uh, MECFS patients have, uh, who have a high amount of uh, uh, the uh, fibronectin has both the cellular fibronectin as well as plasma fibronectin high. So plasma fibronectin is basically secreted by hepatocytes, only hepatocytes, whereas cellular fibronectin, which is an essential component of extracellular matrix, is produced by endothelial cells, platelets, macrophages, and all those things, TH, TH1, T cells, things like that, yeah. So it seems that there is a very distinct pattern over here, both cellular and, um, and, and um, plasma fibronectin is upregulated. And there is interesting uh, uh, correlation over here also that, um, again, I'm talking about serum fibronectin here. There is a trend that uh, uh, female uh, individuals tend to have more amount of fibronectin than the male individuals. So if we say that there is a uh, pathological label of uh, fibronectin, then it is, seems that it is easier for females to reach that pathological amount of fibronectin much more easily than the male. Again, um, um, that you can see over here also. So um, now, we were trying to understand what does this fibronectin mean? And we came across a very old study from 1995. This is a study where trypanosoma infection was done in mice. And if you look into this study, some of the mice died because of the trypanosoma infection. And there, the fibronectin was actually fragmented in these mice. Some of the mice, they survived. And they followed these my, mice over uh, more than four weeks. So what, we, what they saw is that till three weeks post trypanosoma infection, so trypanosoma is a, is a, a parasite, we saw that the fibronectin levels go up in the blood of these mice. And at the same time, the IgM against fibronectin was gone or decreased. Um, after four, uh, three weeks of post-infection, when the mice start to recover, the fibronectin amount starts to fall down. At the same time, the IgM response against the fibronectin goes up. This was very interesting for us. Then we tried to understand what is happening because fibronectin plays a very important role in Borrelia infection, which is the Lyme disease. And you all know that Lyme disease is very closely associated with MECFS. Now what does fibronectin do is that fibronectin helps the bacteria to colonize the endothelial cells. Yeah? So if there is more fibronectin available, there is probability of more colonization of the bacteria. Yeah? And other way around, if the fibronectin is not available within the immune complex, the um, the, the protection against the bacterial infection also goes down. Interestingly, fibronectin also helps in HIV infection and many other viral infections. So to understand what the IgM against fibronectin is, it's a very interesting concept. We believe that the IgM against fibronectin is a natural IgM. Now, what are natural IgMs? There are two different types of IgMs. One IgM which is produced against antigens. Yeah? When we get a virus infection or bacterial infection, these proteins are sensed and then there is an antibody production. This is called the antigen-induced uh, IgM. But there is a second type of IgM, which is called natural IgM, which is produced in the fetus in mother's womb itself. It doesn't require an antigen. It is a positive selection. And the basic job of this IgM is to do the scavenging, protecting, and regulating function. I would recommend everyone to go through uh, this nice review. And what we see is that, very interestingly, not every B cell produces this IgM. There is a very specific type of B cell called plasma B1 B cells. And they are most predominantly in bone marrow, but they are also fi find a very small amount in other secondary and tertiary lymphoid organs. And uh, their job is to clean when a cell dies the uh, proteins like manage binding lectins and C1Q, they come and bind to the different um, dying cell parts. And then these are identified by these natural IgMs, which take them 
into the cleaning pathway. Therefore, autoimmunity is strongly uh, uh, related or uh, associated with these natural IgMs. So if you lose natural IgM, you start developing autoimmunity against the dying cells in the body or the debris. Okay? This is the whole concept over here. So we try to look into this natural IgM, particularly IgM against fibronectin in, uh, in uh, MECFS patients and uh, long COVID patients. So you see that, um, interestingly, so this is a log two value here. You don't really visibly see the difference because we have a different population of uh, patients, different numbers, so we have to put the value into log two value. So any small difference that you see over here is actually a huge difference. So um, every dot over here is individual patients. So you see that the natural IgM against fibronectin is actually a lot depleted even in the patients who have recovered from SARS-CoV-2 infection. But this depletion is actually going on and further depletion is going on in mild and the severe long COVID patients. Now, question, uh, I, I spoke to a couple of big experts in the field. Um, I spoke to Akiko Iwasaki from Yale and she asked me the question, is it only one natural IgM or the total natural IgM in the body is affected? Yeah, it's a big question because we cannot conclude anything if we say one natural IgM is going down. So we looked into two of the most well-studied natural IgMs. One is against phosphorylcholine. Phosphorylcholine is a, a modification in proteins. Um, when the cells die, the protein has to be cleared. They undergo specific modifications so that these natural IgM can actually detect. So differentiating self versus non-self. So phosphorylcholine is a modification Mal uh, malonaldehyde is specific type of modifications. There are natural antibodies against these modifications, so they don't detect the protein, they detect the modifications in the protein, so they are polyreactive uh, uh, um, antibodies. So we looked into these two groups of uh, natural IgM, and you see the, exactly the same pattern. They are already decreased in the long COVID patients who have recovered, but not much of a difference between healthy controls. But in the mild and the long COVID patients, severe long COVID patients, the decrease is much more higher. If we look into the um, MECFS patients, there is uh, association. Uh, severe MECFS patients uh, tend to have a low amount of these uh, natural IgMs. Again, there is <coughs> seems to be a tendency for women to have more of the natural IgM, which can be probably explained in terms of evolutionary. Uh, perspective that uh, the female body requires clearance of dead cells much more often than the male body, again in uh, hypothesis or explanation. So uh, the depletion is much more felt in female body than the male body. Now, so far we have been hearing about the clinical overlapping between uh, MECFS and long COVID, so we try to see how much long COVID patients overlap with MECFS patients in terms of biochemical features. Yeah? We looked into the IgM against FN1, the fibronectin, and the fibronectin, so we did a multivariate analysis. We tried to see. So if you look into healthy controls and severe MECFS patients, again, MECFS is a broad patient group, mild, moderate, and um, uh, severe patients suffering or going through uh, tens of years of disease progression. So we focused on severe MECFS over here. So you can see that up to um, um, they, they are quite uh, different from each other, and if you look into the long COVID patients, both mild and the severe long COVID patients, they tend to form a, a similar tendency. So there is a lot of overlapping if we talk about only these uh, fibronectin and um, um, IgM against fibronectin. If you compare the MECFS and long COVID groups, they look exactly the similar. The only difference is that the IgM against fibronectin is a little bit more depleted in, uh, in the long COVID patients. Uh, but if you compare the severe MECFS patients with severe long COVID patients, it's absolutely no difference between them. Now, <clears throat> the difference, basic difference here between long COVID and MECFS is that long COVID starts with SARS-CoV-2 infection. It's a very fast infecting virus. It just takes over the whole body. Yeah? In the patients who did not have um, any strong effect of uh, COVID infection in the beginning, they did not go to the, um, to the hospitals, they, they suffered. Uh, mild symptoms in the beginning, they are the most um, common patients who develop into the long COVID. And this is very important for our understanding that the long COVID, or the, the, the SARS-CoV-2, when it enters into the cell, it interacts with many different features. The, one of the features is these herpes viruses. 
Yeah, we shown previously that SARS-CoV-2 infection reactivates HHV6 at least in the cell culture. And when HHV6 reactivates, it actually suppresses SARS-CoV-2 infection because of the, uh, the alterations in the, um, in, the, in the cytokine and things like that. So there is a co-infection going on again here, two viruses coming together. If the virus, the SARS-CoV-2, is not good enough to take over the cell, then they face all these already pre-sitting viruses inside the body, and that changes the whole physiology of the cell and how the disease develops. So I just thought of bringing some fresh data this week. So what I presented you is the patients who were into six to 12 months after the first SARS-CoV-2 infection. I spoke to many people. I spoke to, spoke to um, friends from um, US patient organization, and I got the idea that I should even try into the patients who are into longer process. They have gone through 18 months, two years, three years after the first COVID infection. We are recruiting these patients, but I fortunately got um, um, a group of patients um, these uh, three individuals over here are 20 months onward after the first SARS-CoV-2 infection. They are perfectly healthy at this moment, but these are patients who have been officially declared as MECFS. They are very young, within 21 to 40 years of age, and they are now officially MECFS after two years of first SARS-CoV-2 infection. Now we look into IGMFN. It's not a data that makes any sense because there's only a small number of patients, but still it gives us information. If you look into the IGM-FN, which has recovered to the same level that we see in healthy controls, but the MECFS patients have a wide variety, but the majority of them have still low amount of this IGM against fibronectin. Yeah? This is a very, I'm not telling that this is going to um, um, give us the clue to cure the disease, but this is very important for the treatment purpose because we are depleting, if, if, if I'm right, we are depleting these natural IgMs. So if we need a treatment, we have to supplement these natural IgMs or the, so, the cells, the plasma V1, V cells, which actually produce these um, IgMs. So the end slide, um, I believe that uh, MECFS is again one disease. It starts with a viral infection, probably SARS-CoV-2. You never know. It can be an enterovirus. It can be a flu, things like that. It just affects many different things. The, the inside of the cell, inside of the body, is a very complex process. One virus reactivates another virus, and then things like that. For example, SARS-CoV-2 and herpes virus over here. Then, then comes the uh, role of viral microRNAs, due to paste proteins, and things like that. Even SARS-CoV-2 spike protein, we, we have enough evidence to show that the spike protein is capable of changing herpes virus behavior inside the cells. Um, so this leads to direct mitochondrial dysfunction in the localized tissues, in the localized cells. But the key factor comes when viral reactivation reaches to these prim uh, primary lymphoid organs or the infection. This we learned from the long COVID experience that uh, there is a depletion of these uh, natural IgM, which seems to be a black and white picture over here. Almost all patients infected with SARS-CoV-2, at least the initial SARS-CoV-2, they deplete this natural IgM. And probably this is responsible for chronic inflammation. As a result of inflammation, you increase fibronectin, and this fibronectin then acts as a cell danger response molecule. It binds to TLR2, TLR4, induce the innate immune response, and in, together with the um, autoantibodies, it then starts affecting the endothelial cells, then mitochondrial function leads to more ROS, and then the vicious cycle starts over here, and these fibronectin actually can also uh, do mast cell activation, platelet activation, because they tend to aggregate on these cells and cause granulation of these cells. So again, this is a very preliminary area of study. We never heard about natural IgMs. This is for the first time. So the field is open now. We have to think, we have to take a positive mind and to understand what exactly is going on over here. So during the chronic illness, I believe that um, imbalanced complement activation is playing a role. We are getting more and more infections. We are not clearing them up. Autoimmunity is coming up in different ways. Different patients have different type of autoimmunity. Then depending on which type of herpes virus you are reactivating, some are reactivating EBV, some are reactivating H36. You have a different effect from that. Uh, viral molecular mimicry plays an important role. And then you come up with all these in terms of mitochondrial dysfunction, through the immunoglobulins and things like that. So if you look over here, all the long COVID look like one disease. 
if you look here, then all the long COVID look like 10 different diseases because different persons have different modalities or different clinical features. So with that, I uh, like to thank um, all the collaborative partners, funders in different parts of the globe. Um, we are a small uh, group in Germany, only four people. And we have been funded by um, many different uh, organizations, which is very key, including the MECFS patient community, who has uh, funded a um, small amount, but a um, large part of our research over the last five to seven years. So thank you very much for your attention, and um, I would like to take a lot to take questions. Thank you, Bipesh. Questions? Just on the front here. Hi. Um, the slides that you've put up there, Bupesh, particularly the last one, are they going to be in your forthcoming paper? Yes. Excellent. Yeah. So... <laughs> you sound surprised. The, 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 the field is, um, again, it's very difficult to convince different ideologies into one. Uh, I spoke to many uh, colleagues over here, and we find a lot of overlapping between each other's idea. So everyone thinks differently, but there is a unified pattern over here, and that's the beauty of our work for this conference over here. And very, I'm very happy um, that uh, we came together, discussed, and uh, learned a lot of things. Yeah? So how long have we got to wait for that paper? <laughs> Everyone, also all of them are academics here, so they know how painful it is. Um, sometimes it takes one, two, three years to publish a paper. So um, I don't know. Um, yeah, as, I, as I told all the um, uh, patient community also, um, uh, we did not uh, want to put the paper directly into bioarchive. We, we put the paper into a journal which has its own preprint service, and the journal put the paper into preprint once they send the paper into the review process. So we have to wait for four to six weeks so the journal takes the decision. If that is not happening, then we will see to put it into the med archive or something like that. But again, the whole idea of bringing the paper here before publication is that there is a stimulation in the community, and uh, uh, if the data is good, then uh, it is going to help uh, in the future planning of treatment modalities. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, behind you, Richard. To your right. No. Yeah. Um, hello, Bupesh. Do you actually look at um, patients' um, histories and do you see an increased uh, level of infections in their earlier lives, viral infections, bacterial infections, maybe maybe heavy use of antibiotics, that kind of thing. Do you see any kind of correlation there? Uh, unfortunately, we are not directly uh, clinically associated um, with or any clinical centers, so we cannot do this type of things. And MECFS patients have a longer history most of the times, and you cannot just go back and uh, realize what happened. But we have learned a lot from the long COVID story. So we have. We have patients in our surrounding where we are living, and we see uh, this um, increased um, reactivation of herpes viruses, bacterial infections, fungal infections, and things like that, which is, uh, which is again, um, um, uh, telling us that um, we can just simply ignore, cannot ignore the secondary infections as a second prospect. They all play a contributing role to the disease development process. Yeah. Okay, I think we're done. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, Bipesh. Thank, thank you. you.